When did you get the idea to write the book? I had uh, written a book on diversity, that was the title of it, and while writing it I kept running into some very angry people who seemed to be angry for no reason that I could discern. They were kind of professionally angry. Mad at you? No, they were just mad. Just mad. Uh, and their, their concerns were in, in many cases about racial conflict, but I didn't have much experience of it in their lives. They were just concerned that uh, uh, this was something they should be angry over. This was in the early 2000s? Yeah, early 2000s. And when I finished writing that book, I had a few threads I was interested in. One of them was uh, learning more about this sort of free-floating anger, which uh, had about it a quality that surprised me. It was uh, anger mixed with pride. I'm angry and proud of it. Right. And that's where the book began. When was the book published? 2007. And, uh, what, just, so just say the thesis in, in, a, in a nutshell. What's the proposition of the book? Right. The proposition is that uh, American culture has changed from a society, from a culture that uh, viewed anger as a danger, as something that was distorting the personal character of those who gave into it or made a habit of it, uh, to a culture that celebrates anger. Uh, I call this new celebratory anger, new anger. Uh, it's not entirely new. There's always been angry people who are mixing their anger with pride. The new anger is anger that's good. It's good anger. Right. It's, it's, it, it has uh, more than the usual quotient of self-righteousness about it. It is uh, anger that's frequently flamboyant. It looks to display itself. It's not anger that is in any fashion at all held in, but rather it is shaped and crafted to be presented to the public. Look at me, I'm angry. So it has a narcissistic quality about it as well. And this anger is on the rise, you think? I think it's been on the rise pretty much for half a century, but it's really broken into public view in the last quarter of that. Um, we now have it I think I would say in just about every aspect of life, any place I cared to look, I could find pretty uh, dramatic examples of it. It's so 50 years ago, so you're saying it's post -World War II. Uh, the post-World War II era mm -hmm. has witnessed a steady rise in uh, not the uh, suspicious view of expressions of anger, but more a welcoming and celebration of anger as a kind of a good authenticity. Yes. And this has been going on, you say, for some decades now, and is, has peaked, is about to peak, peaked 10 years ago? No, I, I think we're, we're in the very midst of it, and uh, it's quite possible that it will continue that way. Um, angriest sector of American life today? Politics? Politics is probably the angriest sector right now. If you'd like, I, I can fill in why I think we've had this 50-year trajectory. Uh, there are historians who study anger. And Let me ask you one other thing. Let me just want to get another thing first. Sure. Tell me about ambient anger. Ambient anger. Um, I came up with that as a description when I performed a little experiment. I was living in Boston at the time, and I went into Kenmore Square near Fenway Park, um, timed myself for 15 minutes, just going to start and stop, and, and w wanted to just make myself as much of a... Kind of ethnographic right, research. An ink blot yeah. blotter. I was going to take in as much anger as I could find in 15 minutes. And during that time, I did not witness a single episode of people uh, Screaming, shooting each shooting other, each other screaming, cursing, cursing. loudly. Yeah. No, but I, but I found lots of things like bumper stickers that were just gratuitously nasty. People dressing in an aggressive way with sort of halos of spikes and their skin pierced in a fashion that was intentionally grotesque and made to look angry. Uh, so there was anger fashion. There was anger uh, affect in the way a lot of people behaved. Um, not that they were at that moment angry, but uh, they were suggesting that anger had become a fashion statement, that mm -hmm. it had become a, a way of uh, positioning themselves in relation to 
the, the, the street, the strangers around mm -hmm. them. Everybody should take notice of me because in some fashion or another, I'm angry. It's an attitude. It's kind of an attitude. Right. He's and got attitude. It's She's got it's attitude. It's ambient the way smog is. Yeah. It, it's all around It's us. in the environment. Mm -hmm. And you're saying this is different than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, uh, you say in the beginning of the book, you say uh, a bee in the mouth is always bad. You don't say it. You heard some guy say it. That's right. And you tried to find out who had whether this was a folk saying, or you, but long story short, you could never fig, you never really figured out what you know what this saying was. But this guy mm -hmm. said a bee in the mouth is always bad. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not always bad. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree with that? In well, other words, right. anger is not always bad. No, anger is not always bad. But he, this was a workman who was yeah. reacting to another workman who has lost his head and was just cussing and blue streak on the street. And he was warning him that you give in to your anger that way, and it's going to have bad consequences for you. The, the and so he, shout, he said back to him, by way of reprimand, yeah. a bee in the mouth is always bad. Right. But what I want to press you on a little bit, I mean, I'm not pressing, I know you say this in the book, I'm trying to, I'm trying to establish the fact that anger, I want to know about the moral qualities of anger. I want to talk about that with you a minute. Mm -hmm. um, not all anger is bad. No, certainly not. Anger is, anger is not inherently a bad thing. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's part of our human nature that we have to deal with, and we can deal with it well, or we can deal is with it Is it a poorly. universal trait among humans, that human groups, uh, the individual and sometimes collective expression of anger mm -hmm. is, would you say that's a universal human trait? Um, I'll go out on a limb and say yes. Yes. <laughs> I know. They, you know, anthropologists will never tell you anything because there's always some group somewhere. But generally speaking, nearly universal, pretty damn universal. Right. And would you say that codes, social codes, to either suppress or dampen or slow down anger is also, or is that a universal quality of, of human groups? In, Prob probably. probably. I mean, we, there's a, a group in the Philippines called the Ilongat who are well known as headhunters. And uh, they speak a lot about anger in that culture. When somebody dies, you get angry. And the way in which you get unangry is not a way that I would recommend for most Americans. You have to go kill somebody and cut off their head. Um, so that, 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 that makes your anger go away because ah. now you've, you've appeased your anger. I see. So there are certainly cultural codes in which anger, um, you know, the ultimate purpose is to make your anger go away. You don't want to stay angry, but mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. nonetheless, there is a, a way in which anger can be elaborated that uh, is anything but peaceful. Um, at the other side, medieval monks were counseled that any kind of anger was bad. So monasteries were full of people trying to practice the virtue of patience. The opposite of anger in that setting was patience. Patience was to be cultivated and anger was to be eliminated. So on the scale of world cultures, you can find uh, cultures that take anger as something that in some circumstances can rightly be elaborated and ought to be and other cultures that view it with a great deal of suspicion and reluctance. So there's a wide variability. There's, there's but, a fair amount. But of everybody, variability. cultures would typically have a, an approach to anger that seeks to harness it, control it, direct it, do something other than just give it completely free reign. Right. What, what, you said the opposite of anger is patience. That was the medieval view, yes. Because I noticed, I was looking up some things uh, today, and I noticed that Seneca said um, mm -hmm. the best antidote to anger, well, he actually, uh, the greatest remedy for anger is delay. Mm -hmm. And he also said the deferring of anger is the best antidote to anger. Mm -hmm. So waiting to express anger is the way you deal with anger, mm -hmm. delaying it. That sounds a bit like patience, doesn't it? Patience. <laughs> and in the in the and in the Jewish inscription in the Jewish and Christian scriptures, we learn that God is slow to anger. Mm -hmm. He waits. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. He gets angry sometimes, but he's slow to anger. And we learn that a man, this is what I like, this is in Proverbs, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit is better than he that can take a city. So this slow part. So patience is the opposite of anger. Well, or, there are psychologists today who propose other things than patience, but uh, that's been a view that it's deeply rooted in Western culture. I think Seneca has a version of it. Medieval monasteries had a version of it. Um, it was certainly wrapped into American culture from early on. Uh, George Washington, this is the week of Washington's birthday. He was an angry guy. He was an angry guy who got the esteem of his countrymen for mastering his anger. And we, we don't seem to make that much of it these days. He's seen as a stolen figure without any emotion at all. But he was, he was known for being someone who could uh, just fly off the handle of a moment and rip people apart. And right. that he, he knew that was a vice. and. Uh, he put on this sort of stern self-control. Confirm thy soul and self-control. Yeah. Okay, so so um, so I want to ask now <clears throat> this new anger, mm -hmm. this post-war anger in which we view anger not with suspicion but as much as with a sense of welcoming or celebration. Um, tell me in a nutshell why that's bad. Just Boil it down for me. This is bad because why? Well, it's bad for the individual because it turns out that anger is something like a drug. Actually, it's literally a drug since it hits the endocrine system. And we the more you express it, the more you need it to get the same fix. That's right. So, yeah. so you begin to become um, a kind of addict to anger, and anger feels empowering. Um, people who are angry it's a rush. feel like I'm powerful, and this anger makes me powerful. So it becomes this thing where one fails to learn the art of really listening to other people and solving problems, and in turn substitutes for listening and solving this flamboyant expression of my rage. Okay, so, so it's bad it, for me. It's bad for me. It's certainly bad for the social fabric in that we have real problems in this society to deal with. We have a political system that is meant to cope with some of those problems. That doesn't work if people are simply screaming at each other all the time or spending their hours coming up with clever epithets to put down their rivals rather than trying to figure out ways to solve the problem. So it's socially dysfunctional at that level. It's socially dysfunctional in other ways too. I know the Institute does a lot of work with marriage and the family. Anger is not a glue that holds families together. It is not the bond that makes marriages or most marriages hold together. I suppose some people enjoy uh, 10 rounds and uh, kind of a who's afraid of Virginia Woolf marriage. Right, yeah. but, but that's generally not the model that yeah. most of us seek in entering into marriage. Um, the marriage in this country we know is very fragile these days. We have very high divorce rates. We have high rates of people choosing not to enter marriage out of fear. Um, these are things that are connected with a society that has become too enamored of the virtue of this authentic rage. I, I want my partner to hear just how angry I am. I'm probably not going to settle whatever problem it is that right. has made me angry. Right. Um, so there's, there's three quick well, I mean, would you why. say as a general rule that your, your analysis is that I think of you as a reason guy, mm -hmm. so that whenever anger privileges feelings mm -hmm. in deep, I think anger, I'm, I'm saying this, I'm asking you if you agree, mm -hmm. anger privileges feelings at the expense of reason. Do you think, do you agree? Uh, it, in other words, no. it puts at the forefront how I feel, a passion that I have, mm -hmm. and therefore the, my, my tendency to give reasons, to be patient in listening, and so mm -hmm. forth is compromised. Yes, I, I think that's right, but I don't, I don't want to make too strong a, uh, 
uh, polarization between reason and feeling. Ideally, they work together, and there are feelings that are more hospitable to reason than anger is. Uh, the, the desire to be pleasing to somebody else is frequently an emotion and can be coupled with reason as you think through how to do that. Um, the desire to express your anger, uh, it's a much more animalistic emotion. It is we're, we're not in control of ourselves when we give uh, vent to anger. The Catholic Catechism says that anger is the desire for vengeance. Do you mm. agree that that's right? Actually, I have not thought that one through, but I, can, I believe that anger uh, mm. in some forms is a desire for vengeance. Uh, the, it says, by the way, I, I just want to say, I'll just read you quickly. It says, because um, it has this qualified, what interest, one of the things that interests me about it is that nowhere in the moral teachings have I come across where people just say, never be angry. Anger's bad. It's always this qualified, there's a qualification with it. We're to be worried about it. We can be, it can be used for good or ill, but we learn from the Catholic Catechism that the, pa the principal passions, the feelings, affections, are love, hatred, desire, fear, joy, sang sadness, and anger. In themselves, passions are neither good nor e evil. They have no inherent moral quality. They are morally qualified only to the extent that they effectively engage reason and will. And it says some more things which, which I, I won't go into, but it does, this is this qualifying thing, I think is, it says, um, it says anger is a desire for, for vengeance. To desire vengeance in order to do evil to someone who should be punished mm -hmm. is illicit. If I'm doing evil to a bad guy, mm -hmm. that's wrong. But it is praiseworthy, but on the other hand, mm -hmm. it is praiseworthy to impose restitution to correct vices and maintain justice. If anger reaches the point of deliberate desire to kill or seriously wound, it is gravely against charity. And the Lord says, quote, this is Jesus, everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. So you have this, and then later on, the catechism was right. Jesus does say, um, this is my last Bible verse, you have heard it said, uh, uh, you have heard that it was said by them of old, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Mm -hmm. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, therefore, agree quickly with your adversaries whenever you can. Mm -hmm. So it seems I'm saying, this isn't a question, I'm, say, <laughs> asking, I'm asking if you agree with what I am saying is the Jewish and Christian, maybe some differences between the Jewish and Christian versions of it, but the, let's just say the Judeo-Christian tradition which says, Anger is a passion. It doesn't have an inherently good or bad quality. It's connected with how it's, it, its moral quality depends on how is it expressed in you. But especially, I think, say the Christians, I think especially the Christians, be really worried about this. Mm -hmm. Be really worried. Be very, very slow to anger because it can make you, it can lead you to sin. Mm -hmm. Is that... I think, I think that's a pretty good summary of Christian teaching on anger. Um, I, I know from doing a lot of these talks that as soon as we get into Christian teachings about anger, someone's going to remind me of the Jesus in the temple whipping the money changers. Um, Je Jesus gets angry, and so we have a, a model for what uh, is usually called righteous anger. Uh, the trouble with righteous what, anger is good anger, mm -hmm. and you believe there is such a thing. Yes, I, I do believe there is such. Can a thing. Can you give me a contemporary example of righteous anger? Mm -hmm. um, probably one that you were not especially going to like, but uh, sure. I think that uh, the uh, participants in the Tea Party movement who got blamed for the assassination attempt on uh, Congressman. Giffords uh, were righteously angry over that, that they had done nothing that should have visited blame upon them in that instance, and yet they had 
in effect, uh, a large portion of the national media and much of the saying that they were responsible, that they were responsible, or indirectly for this. responsible, and, th and their response to that was uh, indignant and angry, and I think righteously so. Um, good anger. Good anger. Yeah. People shouting angry anti qaddafi slogans on the streets of Tripoli today and other cities in Libya. Righteous anger? I suspect so, but you know, being an anthropologist, uh, I'm a little wary of jumping in with uh, quick endorsements of what's going on in a culture and place that I don't know well. Uh, the resentment against dictators in the Middle East and North Africa certainly strikes me as something that ought to provoke uh, righteous anger. Protesters in Wisconsin shouting anti-Walker yeah. slogans about taking away their money and bargaining rights. Righteous anger? Um, I th think that was one that I would have to divide into parts. There are people in um, uh, the state capital in Wisconsin comparing Governor Walker to Hitler and Gaddafi and Mubarak, uh, saying some atrocious things about him. Uh, and uh, moreover, and this uh, I think is really concerning, uh, showing up at the homes of uh, uh, Republican legislators and uh, by implication threatening the health and safety of family members, that I cannot think of as in any way righteous anger. Uh, do some of these protesters have a legitimate grievance and the right to be heard? Certainly they do. And I would expect that uh, in their number, there are those who are angry in a manner that could well be called uh, uh, a righteous indignation. So, so your worry or your positing that this is a troublesome trend in our society doesn't preclude uh, marching on the, down the street, sh shouting slogans about uh, uh, the bad guys. In other words, uh, in other words, it doesn't that kind of that kind of rowdy uh, uh, quality to our democracy, where people mm -hmm. just you know. Come well, on, you let you let loose with your uh, disdain for the. You people don't want everybody just to calmly yeah. just. No, talk. no, I don't actually. Yeah. I, I yeah. think <laughs> that I would be. Uh, it's asking, like we're doing now. I'd be asking if you for disagree, an aspect of screw you, buddy. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Same to you. <laughs> uh, ang anger is uh, a resource that has been part of human character in the Western tradition and the Christian tradition. And I expect that there are right ways in which we can unleash anger. Uh, certainly mere boisterousness. Uh, uh, street protest, things that the founders of this country recognized and wrote into the Bill of Rights. We have a right to assemble, and, and that right to assemble involves protest. And protest isn't going to be people talking in monotones about how unhappy they are about the parliament's tax right. policy. Right, right. Um, that, uh, that said, I think we really do need a distinction of some sort between old anger and new anger. Um, and, and, and that's give me it in a nutshell. New, new old anger is anger that I'm trying to govern, and I view the governing of my anger as desirable, and the unfettered display of it as at least potentially a problem. As, as potentially dangerous. Potentially the, dangerous. So anger is a last resort, is the old anger. Slow to anger. You're slow to anger. You're when you do get angry, you've thought through what you're going to do about it. Uh, you're not going to give it free license to go its own way. New anger is, uh, or what you call, am new anger uh, is uh, more uh, without, it's the absence of those old restraints. It, it, takes pride in eliminating those old restraints. I think new anger, to go back to my post-war thing, it draws on two very powerful influences on American culture. One was the domestication of psychoanalysis, which brought with it the idea that anger repressed comes back as neurosis. And boy, Americans took to that. They decided, you know, oh, I'm going to get sick if I don't express my rage at you. <laughs> And so there's a lot of mischief that comes out of the way the Americans t 
took hold of this European idea of depth psychology. The other thing that happened almost at exactly the same time was the importation of European existentialism, which gives us this idea of authenticity, that to be truly authentic, I can't let social barriers and niceties and rules and societal impositions get in the way of putting my true authentic self out there. As it happens, the true authentic self that needs to get out there is not a loving, benevolent one. Not it is too, almost always an angry one. Not too attractive. So but now on this put those two things but on, together. But on the first one you mentioned, these, uh, yeah. these repressed Victorians that mm. Freud and the other founders of the discipline were treating, I mean, that was, you're not saying that's not true, that they, that, you know, the, these, uh, these women who, uh, who, who, who were told these terrible things and had no response for decades. I mean, you know what I mean. The, mm. the, there can be a, a great suffering and illness even associated with the, the inability to um, respond, uh, to, to express one's, there can be suffering that is associated with the inability to express anything that someone says, oh, don't be angry. You know, I mean, there's something to that, right? I, I expect that um, uh, in Vienna in uh, 1900, you could find a fair number of cases of people who were suffering some form of neurosis because they had tried to repress too much or too poorly. But I expect, expect that kind of psychological illness is a vanishing rarity in America today. I don't see very many people who are suffering from over... Yeah. Yeah. Well, but I mean, I'm, I'm not, that's outside my field of specialization, yeah, let's say, yeah, but yeah. I, I'm not yeah. in every day encountering people who uh, I think would be too accurately described as front. too yeah. shut down, uptight, that the sort of the put downs we have of people who are overly repressed are rolled out as early as second grade now, so who, who's left to experience this uh, uh, frozenness of emotions? All right, so we talked about the protesters and the in the two cities. Um, all right. Uh, 2006, the Dixie Chicks. <laughs> the song is called, I'm Not Ready to Make Nice. The refrain is, I'm not ready to make nice. I'm not ready to back down. I'm still mad as hell. And I don't have time to go round and round and round. It's too late to make it right. I probably wouldn't if I could. Because I'm mad as hell, can't bring myself to do what it is you think I should. Mm -hmm. Okay. What kind of anger is that? That's new anger. That's new anger. They're, they're really proud of being angry, and they're holding on to it as a trophy. Hey, look, I'm angry, and I'm going to sing about it. <laughs> <laughs> Where are the Dixie Chicks now? <laughs> so you don't, you're not friendly to this kind of anger. You're no, I'm not. I, I think that's the kind of anger that it's has different. But it's different than righteous anger. Why? It's Why isn't this righteous anger? It's self. They, they had said something about the president. Mm -hmm. Everybody called them names for having said this, say, ugly thing about President Bush. Mm -hmm. They write this book that says basically back at you. You know? Right. Why? Why isn't this righteous anger? Sir, I'm not. It's not. I'm not. Right. I really. Um, I'm, it's a it, real question. It's performance anger. There's no real righteousness in it. it, it is, it's taking anger as a way of celebrating um, your own power, your own immunity from social criticism, um, putting yourself in a position where you essentially are flipping off anyone who disagrees with you doesn't seem to me to be a very constructive place to be. And uh, the, I, I have no, affect of my own against the Dixie Chicks. I like some of their music, <laughs> but uh, yeah. I, I think that they're emotionally positioning themselves there in a way that uh, isn't good for our society. It, it's, it's teaching other people, and we learn so much about emotions from popular music. Yeah, don't we? yeah. I mean, in music your book, is you a talk a lot about yeah. uh, music. You have a whole chapter yeah. and on, uh, on music. All right, I'm going to read a a bit of a poem. Uh, I'm not going to say who wrote it. You, you probably know anyway, because it would give it away. But this, I want you to talk about the kind of anger that you are hearing when you hear this poem excerpt. Okay. 
In my time, streets led to quicksand. Speech betrayed me to the slaughterer. There was little I could do. But without me, the rulers would have been more secure. This was my hope. So the time passed away which on earth was given to me. For we knew only too well, even hatred of squalor makes the brow grow stern. Even anger against injustice makes the voice grow harsh. We who wished to lay the foundations of kindness could not ourselves be kind. And so, when at last the time comes that man can love his fellow man, do not judge us too harshly. What kind of anger do you hear there? I hear old anger. Old anger. I, I hear Are you familiar with this poem, by the way? No, I'm not. First I've heard of it. This is Bertolt Brecht, 1939. He's, he's basically seems to be, um, well, he's talking about the 30s. He's talking about a certain form of uh, social protest that was taking place on the left against Nazism and fascism. And he was basically saying, well, he's basically saying what he said, yeah. that anger against injustice makes the voice grow harsh. Mm -hmm. Hatred of squalor makes the brow grow stern. Mm -hmm. we, who wished, we who wanted the future to be one of kindness could not be kind. Well, I, I suppose he's mistaken about it, just the way John Brown was mistaken that it was a good idea to raid Harper's Ferry. Uh, there, there was a, certainly a righteousness in the cause that John Brown was pushing, but yeah. the method chosen, the, yeah. the, the too stern yeah. brow there, leads yeah. to inhumanity and, and yeah. murder and yeah. injustice. But it is old anger, I think, in your category, right? Because it's... it's, it's it's, he's troubled by it. It's tr he's troubled by a specific thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. He's tr yes. It's old anger because he knows that it's uh, it's a uh, deforming quality mm -hmm. for him, yeah. for the angry guy yeah. like him. He right. knows that he's losing something. Right. He's, he, he's not proud that he has lost yeah, that thing. Yeah. 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 So. All right, we got to wrap it up so we can let other people talk. But um, um, Ann Coulter. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned her name. Um, in that I think what I call new anger is much more common in American society on the cultural left than it is on the cultural right. But while it's much more common there, it's a matter that the right has its own mavens of anger as well. And Ann Coulter is a really good instance of that. She, she would just say she's got a shtick, she's being funny. Well, maybe, maybe so, but you know, there's lots of ways to rationalize th this yeah. sort of thing. But she trades in a vitriolic expression. Yeah. And uh, the the pursuit of, of new, an, new anger with her. It's new anger all the way with her. Al Franken. Uh, new anger all the way with him. Newt Gingrich. I, you know, that's a harder case in that uh, I don't think that his general affect is an angry one, but I do see that he sort of wavers back and forth between a, a look at me kind of anger and a kind of reluctance we're betraying the older values type thing. I see a lot of that in conservatives where they feel the temptation of new anger, but they also feel the restraint of the old anger. And, and it's that sort of mixture of the two qualities that seems to me to be most conspicuous on the right. right. On the left, you don't see much of that pulling back quality. That's just, let's go for it. And, um, I got in trouble in writing the book in that uh, a lot of readers from the left would read it and thought that this wasn't fair shake, that I was uh, slanting this as an attack on the left. I didn't mean it to be. It seems to me I'm talking about a cultural change that preceded the polarization in politics, that this, this uh, unleashing of anger as now a normative part of American life happened before it became a left-right issue. But you're arguing that pe you're arguing that the left is more uh, full in on this subject of new anger 
because they're less given to uh, respecting the old restraints. There's no hearkening back to the value of the traditions that still are heard at least faintly by Whereas people. Whereas you're arguing right. that conservatives are more torn about yeah. the whole thing. Yes. Okay, borking of Robert Bork in the hearings of 1987. Oh, that was an outrageous episode in American history, and it certainly put new anger uh, out where we all could see it, where uh, senators lined up to perform anger. They weren't people who were necessarily felt any anger at all towards Judge Bork, but they wanted to, for political reasons, display their anger, and they did so by sacrificing not just that judicial appointment, but by poisoning the judicial confirmation process to this day. One year later, Gingrich taking down Speaker Jim Wright on ethics charges that no one now can remember. <laughs> Had to do with uh, his... Book royalties. Book royalties, yeah. Um, Righteous or new? Um, I'm not sure anger was in play there. It was opportunism. Uh, here was a vulnerability of a political rival and a way to get rid of him. And, uh, but don't you think, I mean, don't, to me, uh, the reason I bring up Gingrich again is because it seems to me that he was actually a very pivotal figure in all this in our politics. Mm -hmm. I think, to me, he was the carrier of the new anger because he, um, he more than anybody else, represented that kind of uh, slash and burn, screw you, throw out every rule of civility, mm -hmm. this is nothing but war, there are no rules in war, I'm coming at you with everything I can all day. He was that embodiment. And then, so to me, he does not fit your rule of the, le the left is leading the way and the conservatives are ambivalent. To me, the pioneer of anger politics, <coughs> the Bork hearings preceded that episode of, by a year. And that was the left. Mm -hmm. But I think the poster boy for the kind of destructive anger that's taking place in American politics now is our Gingrich on the right and Car James Carville on the left. All is war. Mm -hmm. We're just it's a it's just a fist fight. It's just a fist fight. Anything else is And that's good. It, that's, that's good. Yes. Right? right? Do you buy that analysis? I think I, I'm gonna take a pass on it. I don't know about Gingrich. I, he's not someone that I've paid sufficient attention to. There was a book written by somebody on the left towards the end of the 1990s that uh, talked about the triumph of meanness and the new meanness, and Gingrich was the embodiment of the new meanness. He prefers meanness to anger, I think. Mean, anger. I guess, is a little different than angry. Yeah, but, um, but it was in, in that ballpark, so. Yeah. All right, so we got to, we're gonna take just a couple more minutes on uh, me getting to ask questions and then <laughs> turn it over to others. But um, I wanna push, I just want to push a little bit more on this who's angrier, the left or the right, mm -hmm. okay? Because you say in your book, you say at the moment the left is far angrier. Yeah. The that book, was 2006. The book, right, Bush was president. On page 90 you say conservatives have been relatively slow in realizing that they are up against a new kind of cultural phenomenon. Do you think more anger is coming from the right today or more anger is coming from the left today in our political and public discourse? I think we are probably as polarized as we've been as a nation, at least since the Civil War. Uh, there is uh, immense reserves of anger, or maybe reserves is the wrong word here, um, supplies. Supplies of it. <laughs> Arsenals. <laughs> on both the left and right. And uh, I think it's a really hard call to say which is more angry. Uh, although I would say it's not so hard a call to say which has more new anger. Um, the, the anger on the right is much more of this hybrid thing where uh, some of it is rooted in the reluctant kind of anger. and. Uh, some of it is uh, this do proud, flamboyant vitriol. Uh, but, but you don't as think the total there's just simply more anger coming from the right today than the left? Just more quality, just quantity. Let's figure out, let's, let's, let's bracket quality. Let's just go for poundage. Mm -hmm. Don't you think there's more coming from the right of the political spectrum today than the left? 
No, I don't think so. Um, I'm, I'm looking at Wisconsin again. And, uh, I'm All right, Ray, you, you say in the book, this is my last shot at this, you say <laughs> in the book that against Clinton, conservatives were outraged, and against Bush, that liberals were enraged. Yes. You make a distinction between outrage and rage. People who don't like Obama today, are they outraged or are they, ra are they enraged? What's the, what's the word, rage or outrage, against for, to describe people who spend a lot of time criticizing Obama? Strong, you know, his fiercest critics. Are they outraged or are they expressing rage? Good judgment. <laughs> Um, or that would be another possibility. <laughs> uh, there are clearly some who are enraged in the same way the left was enraged at Bush. However, uh, he's a murderer, you know, whatever. I mean, whatever. The, no, Clinton was the murderer, right? He Clinton, right. Bush. Well, I forget what Bush was. I, but Obama was not really an American, he was born in a foreign country, he's a Muslim, et cetera, et cetera. The editor of the New Republic, um, under, in the midst of the Bush years, begins a major statement in this mainstream political journal, I hate, I George. hate George W. Bush. Right. Um, that's a sort of breathtaking departure yeah. in American politics. Yeah. I. I mean, I, I may be wrong about this, but I don't know of a mainstream American publication where one can find a, a well-respected editor, public intellectual, making about that. About Dinesh I, D'Souza in Fortune right. magazine. Uh, he's an, he's, the country's being ruled by a boast of a, the country's being ruled by an African tribesman. Uh -huh. yeah. right. It's a vitriolic statement. It's sounds like new anger to me. Um, I'm not sure I put that in the same category as the I hate George W. Bush. Mm -hmm. It might take a little of explaining to do that, but, but, but one is sort of a leading voice of liberal politics in America feeling unabashed, uh, even though it, it, I think his next statement was there, there, I've said it. He yeah. knew he was transgressing something. Yeah. Um, but it was new anger in the sense that he, 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 he wanted to transgress. Right, he, he did. He, and once he, he did, he, he, he felt did. good about he, it. He, he, was a f he felt good about that transgression. Right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But see, I, my, I think where I'm maybe disagreeing with you, Peter, is I think you're placing a very strong analytic em em emphasis on this difference between what you call new and old. Mm -hmm. Old, I'm worried about it. New, I'm celebrating it. Oh, well, you should, yes. And, and I, I hear you, mm -hmm. and I'm listening, and I read the book. Uh, but I, uh, I'm just, what, what hits me today is just the, um, <clears throat> the complete uh, coarsening of all of our public conversation. Uh, and I, uh, I don't trace it uh, more to the left or the right. I think the right, to, to me, the right today is the angrier segment of our culture, but, but Lord knows it could change again tomorrow because it seems to me that we, something has happened, some kind of umbrella of restraint mm -hmm. that probably are, is somewhat uh, religious in nature, ultimately, a real, uh, an umbrella that said, I should not attack you personally. I should not tell lies about you. I should not accuse you of being a horrible person. I should not go to your friends or your children. I should not stalk your children at their school mm -hmm. to, to say what a horrible human being you are because there's something apart from politics, apart from how much I loathe your politics, that just tells me that is a morally wrong thing to do. Mm -hmm. The evaporation of that moral umbrella where then political, you know, my desires and my wishes politically rise to the level of the religion mm -hmm. permits me then to say all those things and to stalk your children and to say lies about you in the paper or say whatever I want to say because it's tactically advantageous for me to do so. 
it's tactically advantageous and it's convenient since we now have electronic media that allow for virtually no delay at all between but my you having really think more of that control. comes from the left than the right and you think it's analytically well, important but I, I think you. this is a, a sidetrack that we don't really need you, all right you asked me whether I thought more was on the left or right yeah and I answered you but I don't really think that's the germane question mm -hmm. that it's that it's in both places is self-evident okay and and that it is uh, a problem is self-evident. So, the, so the, I, the, I take it that the real issue here is that as a culture, we've licensed anger too much, and we have lost restraint over it, and we need to regain that. And that is a bad thing for the individual and for the group, and the partisan question of which political party is more guilty is for you a subordinate question. Yes. It's not the main question. It's, it's a subordinate question. Mm -hmm.